in this part of the conference, I would like us to engage in dialogue with indigenous peoples' cultures. Are there unheard voices in our time? Or are there voices silenced by those who could not accept the truth? As one title of a popular movie in 1994 suggests, Reality Bites. In this part of the conference, let me share some personal notes on how enriching and eye-opening were my interactions with some indigenous people and highlight the wisdom we could derive from looking closely at the cultures of our indigenous people or, simply put, our local cultures. Let us also engage in self-introspection or, in Catholic language, examine our conscience. Have we listened to the cultures of our own people? Did we lend our ears to listen to their stories so that we could retell them to one another? Or worse, have we delegated them at the margins because we are still very much imbued with colonial mentality? Dialogue suggests an attitude of respect and friendship which permeates or should permeate all those activities constituting the evangelizing mission of the church. This is what we glean from the recent document of the church regarding its mission of gospel proclamation. Evangelization has taken a radical shift after centuries of planting the western form of church in different places as the only way to proclaim the gospel Today, we are called to communion in diversity. Plurality of expressions should be respected as part of our common search for a better world. Faced with concerns about justice, Mother Earth, multicultural communities, and varied religious orientations, we are enjoined to rethink and reform our efforts towards a more just and humane world. There is a need to engage in dialogue where peoples, cultures, the environment, religions, and societies are regarded with respect and openness in order to learn from each other. Like God who continues to dialogue with us in love and friendship, we too are asked to be sacraments of God's communication with the world. We take our cue from Jesus, who was the incarnated Word of God, a God reaching out in full communion with us, a prophet mighty in deed and in word. As he proclaimed the reign of God or the kingdom of God, ang pamamayani ng kagandahang loob ng Diyos, so do we as a church should follow his lead. Dialogue with culture is often referred to in the Catholic Church as inculturation. It is the process of appropriating the gospel into one's own culture. These two realities mutually threw light on each other, patterned after the divine action in the incarnation of Jesus. Inculturation aims at communicating the gospel in a meaningful and challenging manner by rethinking and embodying in accord to a people's cultural tradition. Pope Paul VI, in spelling out what this means, says that evangelization loses much of its force and effectiveness 
if it does not take into consideration the actual people to whom it is addressed, if it does not use their language, their signs and symbols, if it does not answer the questions they ask, and if it does not have an impact on concrete life. While the term enculturation is relatively recent, what it refers to has been part of Christianity since its inception. Vatican II reminds us of this in Gaudium et Spes Article 58. Living in various circumstances during the course of time, the Church too has used in her preaching the discoveries of different cultures to spread and explain the message of Christ to all nations, to probe it and more deeply understand it, and to give it better expression in liturgical celebrations and in the life of the diversified community of the faithful. Enculturation is part of Catholic tradition which unfortunately had been marginalized for a long time. Vatican II has retrieved its significance for Catholicism because we are inextricably cultural. Evangelization cannot but deal with culture. The SVD anthropologist Louis Luzbitak untiringly reminded his readers all human beings are cultural beings. Jesus must be culturally relevant if he is really to be understood and appreciated. This is a most obvious fact, unfortunately, only too often overlooked. Culture is a tradition of experiences. It is a creation of a human community through experiences of trial and error, as well as trial and success. In interacting with their environment in order to survive and enhance life, members of a group develop certain feelings, beliefs, and behaviors they deem humanizing. Synthesized gradually, and eventually into a system of living life, this pool of knowledge is handed on, Latin traditio, a handing on, to and to a large extent benefits the next generation. Culture, however, is not static. It is constantly renewed in response to changing needs and challenges of people. In this way, we find wisdom of the past, the verb of the present, and the vision of the future all converging in one cultural tradition. Although we share a common humanity, the variety of expressions and ways of seeking for the fullness of life is undeniable, especially in Asia and the Philippines. The data of the United Nations, for example, reveal that there are more or less 110 ethno-linguistic groups of indigenous people in the country. While the church used to maintain the position that we are the one true religion, after Vatican II, this exclusivist stance was replaced with a positive outlook towards other faiths and other cultures. The Council retrieves the universality of salvation which God offers. Here, pluralism is perceived as a manifestation of the Spirit's action in human history through different cultures and traditions. There are many signs of this effective presence of God in the world. 
because the creative and life-giving power of God transcends human limitations. The Church in the Philippines has pri prior to Vatican II has largely imposed Western theological thought and sadly, though at times overtly, suggested the inferiority of the Filipino culture. During the Second Vatican Council, however, it has officially declared its intent to become truly rooted in every culture. In a way, enculturation is no stranger to Filipino Catholicism. Going through the text of the first catechism published in the Philippines in 1593, one notices the use of our ancient baybayin or syllabari, our indigenous way of writing. Almost most noteworthy from a Filipino standpoint is the translation of the Amanami by the author of Doctrina Christiana, Father Juan de Placencia, OFM. Keywords and phrases utilized reflect and evoke Filipino sentiments, much more than the present translation recited in our churches. Today, I have written a whole book to reflect on these cultural sentiments and values of Filipinos reflected therein. Following this practice of drawing from the rich meanings of our native language, Filipino lay theologian Jose M. De Mesa has written isang maiksing katisismo para sa mga bata na dapat munang pag-aralan ng matatanda. A short catechism for children which adults should learn first. To articulate the core of the Christian faith in terms of kagandahang loob. The relationship between God and people, Jesus Christ, faith and discipleship, and the church, and the meaning of life are explained in the light of this key Filipino value. This catechism is written completely in Filipino because of a conviction that the enculturation of theology can only truly happen if the lingua franca of theology and religious education as well as catechetical instruction in the Philippines should be in the vernacular rather than in English. The penchant and talent of Filipino for music have led to the composition of enculturated religious songs for use in Catholic gatherings. Himig Jesuita, particularly the compositions of Eduardo Antiveros, and other Filipino Jesuits readily come to mind. Less well known are the music of the Redemptorist Father Chofilo Vinteres for the Mass and the production of religious hymns by the Franciscans, the Dominicans and the Augustinian missionaries of the Philippines. There have also been efforts of inculturating the liturgy. The Misa ng Bayang Pilipino readily comes to mind. It introduced the use of manopo to express reverence for the gospel text read during the Mass and the practice of the priests of receiving communion last after the Filipino custom of the host of a handaan or feast, eating only after all the guests have been served. It is, however, the prayers in the vernacular that demonstrate a deeper form of enculturation, for that is where the genius of the culture is particularly illustrated. To express, we find included cherish Filipino values of reciprocity like pagtitiwala or trust, utang na loob, 
or appreciation of another's kindness. Pagpuno ng kakulangan, compassionate understanding, and solidarity as pakikisama or supportive participation. Pakikiramay, solidarity with, and many more are enshrined in those prayers composed in the different parts of Misa ng Bayang Filipino. The same can be said of the enculturated rite for weddings, ang pagminisa ukol sa pag-iisang dibdib or the wedding mass. The wedding vow speaks of marriage as pagdurugtong ng buhay, a joining of lives that calls forth the pledge of kailan may di kita pagtataksilan. Never will I be unfaithful to you. And kailan may di kita pababayaan. Never will I abandon you. Filipino values in relationships that are truly treasured and mattered. The four theology books I have co-written with Dr. Jose de Mesa have also been written in view of enculturating the Catholic faith. In Love with God, Doing Theology for College Students laid out the direction and process of Filipino theologizing in Mabathalang Pag-aaral. It also proposed God's pagpapadama ng kanyang kagandahang loob as the vernacular counterpart of revelation and faith in theology. In Jesus, God's way of friendship, the Filipino categories of kaginhawahan for salvation and kaibigan for friend were explained and utilized to exemplify the way of doing Christology in the local cultural context. Becoming Church and Being Sacrament, a Filipino theology of church highlights the notion of bakas to articulate the meaning of church as samahan from a Filipino perspective. When beauty beckons theological ethics of Filipino aesthetics, following new developments in Catholic moral theology, probes into the deep meanings associated with our concept of the maganda and initially explores its related biblical, theological, ethical, and spiritual aspects. Taken as a whole, the series lay a foundation for an initial Filipino systematic theology of kagandahang loob. My two latest books, A Legacy Bequitted, which retrieves our Filipino lowland tradition and Judeo-Christian tradition to mutual dialogue and hand on a contextualized theology for the next generation of Christians, plus the reflection on the embedded cultural sensitivity found in the 1593 Amanamin were my efforts to destigmatize our indigenous culture and highlight its richness. Another expression of enculturation in the Philippines is the phenomenon that has been popularly called folk Catholicism, or popular religiosity. We can perhaps simply refer to it as Filipino Catholicism. To differentiate it from the Roman Catholicism we inherited and still largely practice in the Church. It is a true wisdom that, that Filipino Catholicism takes its cue from official Catholicism adopting its symbols and expressions in a way that lends credence to the saying, quid quid recipitur secundum modum recipientis recipitur. Whatever is perceived is perceived according to the mode of perception of the perceiver. This is seen in its celebration of Christmas with the Belen, the nativity scene and its characteristic novena of dawn mass is called Misa di Gallo, or the Mass of the Rooster, in preparation for Christmas. Popular Filipino Catholicism has also both adopted the centrally felt commemoration of the Passion, 
but has added its unique set of practices through the singing and actual dramatization on stage of the Passion, a locally written narrative of the Passion, Death, and Resurrection of Christ. For example, the practice of physical flagellation, a literal bodily commemoration of the Passion and Death of Jesus, would also indicate this. The Filipino embodiment of Catholicism has also ritualized the resurrection in its own singular way through the encounter of the Mater Dolorosa, veiled in black, and the risen Christ in an Eastern Dawn procession. Termed as Salubong, literally a meeting, this Filipino Catholic rite highlights the intimate band between mother and child in the Filipino cultural world feel, as different from the scriptural account in which Mary Magdalene is the first witness of the resurrection. But as in a truly human conversation or dialogue of cultures, there is genuine listening and learning from each other. There are indications that the official Roman Catholic tradition has not only begun to listen to popular Catholicism, but also has learned from it. Maligned, rejected, or ignored previously by the former, the persistence and continuing vitality of the latter have eventually not only called the attention of the Roman Catholicism to the merits represented by the popular Filipino Catholicism. It has also shown the way to the development of a truly enculturated spirituality for Filipino Catholics. The Catholic Bishop's Conference of the Philippines, officially representing the Roman tradition, has explicitly acknowledged in a pastoral letter how the popular Filipino tradition of Catholicism has legitimately and commendably expressed it in an enculturated fashion. In that letter on Filipino spirituality, they speak not only about the traditional expressions found in popular Catholicism regarding the birth, passion, and death, as well as resurrection of Christ, as dealt with above, but also, more importantly, about the traditional wisdom found in the Filipino culture and the fondness of Filipinos to touch, smell, and feel God and be touched and smelled and felt by God, as expressed in reverently touching with a handkerchief as, or small towel or statues or images of Jesus Christ and the saints, and afterwards touching the same piece of cloth on the ailing parts of their bodies. The bishop do not just say that the culture of the Filipino provides them with such expressions but that Filipino Catholics do utilize the culture to express Catholicism. The official adoption of the Salubong as the entrance rite of its first Easter celebration of the Eucharist by the Catholic Bishops' Conference of the Philippines in 1971 is a telling example of this. With the points I mentioned earlier, we can ask whether this suggests that popular Catholicism, a form of Catholicism rooted in the Filipino cultural tradition, is already on its way to being recognized as a genuine and legitimate Filipino theological tradition of the Catholic faith. After all, popular Catholicism, even as it has its own limitations or weaknesses, ought also to be credited for a couple of things. In terms of intertraditionality, for handing on the Catholic faith to Filipinos 
from generation to generation. Maybe it has done this more than the official Catholicism. And in terms of interculturality, for strengthening the Filipino cultural tradition by making use of it to express faith in Jesus Christ and thereby giving it another form of felt presence in Filipino society. According to Jose de Mesa, to avoid a superficial understanding of culture and to comprehend the importance of enculturation, it is necessary to bear in mind a few things regarding culture itself. Three things characterize culture in general. Culture covers everything in life. Culture is second nature to us. Culture is a tradition of experiences. Culture covers everything in life. The whole of life with its different facets is the scope of culture. As an integrated system of beliefs, values, and customs, as well as institutions that express those beliefs, values, and customs, culture provides a sense of identity, continuity, and security to those who belong to it. Culture is not everything in life, but it does influence every aspect of life many of them very deeply. Culture is second nature to us. Through the socialization process, every newborn child within a particular human community interiorizes in general its design for living life in the world. The internalization is overall usually so successful that members of this culture at a certain point are no longer aware they are cultured. It is who we develop to an intuitive knowledge of our own culture, which people from another culture can hardly know. But its downside is our tendency to judge other people's manner of feeling, thinking, and believing, or even behaving, in terms of our own culture. Third, culture is a tradition of experiences. It is a creation of a human community through experiences of trial and error, as well as trial and success. In interacting with their environment in order to survive and enhance life, members of a group develop certain feelings, beliefs, and behavior that will make their lives more humane. They synthesize this eventually and hand it on to the next generations. My first encounter with the Mangyans in Mindoro left me in awe and wonder at the beauty of true sharing and solidarity among them. Their houses were built around the Kubo, the native house, which was used to keep the wealth, so to speak, of the whole tribe. In post-colonial language, this may be likened to a bodega, or warehouse, where all the community's produce and provisions are stuck up. The fathers of the families would go up the mountain every day to plant or hunt for food. Mothers stayed home to take care of the children and looked after some livestock like pigs and chicken, which are being bred by the community to augment the community's food supply. Everything is shared in common. Children are taught in their local language by their elders with some formally educated Mangyans who assist in providing the needed education therein. 
Whenever I look back at this experience, I am reminded of the first community of Christians formed after Jesus' resurrection. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. Something similar to this may be seen in the way of life of the Aitas in Pampanga when I had the chance to be with them for a couple of days. One day, we were hiking up a mountain to see their crops when we chanced upon a guava tree filled with fruits. The Aitas guiding us in the trek took some and a religious sister who was with me excitedly took quite a lot and put them in her bag. While walking, I asked one of the Aita companions why they only each took one to two guava fruits when the tree was so, has so much more fruits. He said in the vernacular, May mga dadaan pa pong ibang tao na maaring gutom at gustong kumain ng bunga ng bayabas, ma'am. Kawawa naman po kung wala nang matitira sa kanila. Shortly after, the religious sister told me how badly she felt for taking 10 guava fruits after she heard the Aita's answer to my query. Am I my brother's keeper? This was Cain's excuse when God asked him where his brother Abel was. The Aitas look after each other and took only what they needed from the environment. The indigenous value of malasakit or compassion para sa kapwa at para sa kalikasan is powerfully exemplified in this simple gesture displayed by the Aitas. Side B, an indigenous value of Filipinos which we have often forgotten or set aside because we listen more to the consumeristic and individualistic culture introduced by global economic principles that govern many countries in the world including the Philippines. Not to forget would be the charting of a self-sustaining community where life is celebrated and protected through the care for one's land. For many years now, since mining has been approved by the government, Many of our indigenous people are displaced from their ancestral lands. Take away their land and you take away their life because land is life. Is this not the same plight the Israelites had because they were landless in Egypt? For a couple of years, I was able to build relationships with the teachers and leaders of two Manobo communities in the mountains of Surigao del Sur. We engage in mutual exchange of teaching pedagogies and techniques on how education may be provided for the Lumad children. This periodic engagement was cut short by the militarization implemented by the government and the execution or killing of their leaders who were accused of being NPAs and terrorists. The once thriving communities with self-sustaining system of life were driven out of their lands with nowhere to go. How is sustainable development may be like? The government could have learned from these communities 
if they listen to their voices instead of grubbing their lands and gaining more profits for selfish gains. Their stories of being unjustly treated and violently stripped of their rights and dignity communicate to us the strong caution Jesus spoke about. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. It will not be so among you. This was reiterated by Peter to the early Christians. Don't lord it over the people assigned to your care, but lead them by your own good example. Power, when used absolutely, corrupts totally. At the table of dialogue, equality and mutual respect are the only plates that sustain harmony. In contrast, arrogance and domination engenders terrorism and poison human solidarity. Like the prophets who denounce all forms of violence due to abuse of power, we are enjoined to stand firm against any act of exploitation of humans as well as of environment, destruction of the earth, and manipulation of the people by the powers that be abound in the world. Persecution and repression of religious freedom still occur, and many are silenced to speak their minds. These should have no place among us. Instead, all Christians should collaborate in their efforts to bring about liberation from all these death-dealing situations, especially in our country. We acknowledge the genius of every culture. Our way of life may vary, but we respect such plurality and rejoice in the rich heritages across tribes and indigenous peoples' cultures. Although there are aspects in our cultures that are being challenged towards renewal by the gospel, we never lose sight of acknowledging the indispensability of culture in shaping our person, our nation, our history. As Vatican II claims, humans come to an authentic and full humanity only through culture. Likewise, belonging to different faiths, we are called to engage in dialogue that would help us understand each other better, overcome hostility among us, and work towards mutual respect and friendship. With the gigantic tasks our world is facing, we need to join hands in providing solutions to problems that affect the whole of creation. With the fast-changing world of technology, globalization, and movements of people, we are called to be more sensitive to the signs of times, which the Spirit of God calls our attention to. Adequate reflection in the spirit of prayerful valuation may help us plan and prepare for better ways of living. While we take on the challenges of the present time, we also look back at our faith heritages, at our cultural backgrounds, so as not to lose sight of our vision as people trusted by God. As church, we sit together in God's table of fellowship to trace the footsteps of Jesus and bring to life the saving presence of the Spirit across time, 
cultures, and people. Let me end with these words of Pope Francis taken from his current encyclical Fratelli Tutti on Fraternity and Social Friendship released last October 4, 2020. Genuine social encounter calls for a dialogue that engages the culture shared by the majority of the population. A realistic and inclusive social covenant must also be a cultural covenant, one that respects and acknowledges the different worldviews, cultures, and lifestyles that coexist in society. Indigenous peoples, for example, are not opposed to progress, yet theirs is a different notion of progress, often more humanistic than the modern culture of developed peoples. Theirs is not a culture meant to benefit the powerful, those driven to create for themselves a kind of earthly paradise. No authentic, profound, and enduring change is possible unless it starts from the different cultures. Together we can seek the truth in dialogue, in relaxed conversation, or even in passionate debate. To do so calls for perseverance, which entails moments of silence, even suffering. Yet it can patiently embrace the broader experience of individuals and peoples neglected and silenced. We fail to keep our attention focused, to penetrate to the heart of matters, and to recognize what is essential to give meaning to our lives. Freedom thus becomes an illusion that we are peddled, easily confused with the ability to navigate the internet, the process of building fraternity, be it local or universal, can only be undertaken by spirits that are free and open to authentic encounters and dialogue. Thank you for listening.